And joining us now, Tony Clement, the Federal Minister of Industry and the Conservative MP for Perry Sound Muskoka. Welcome back to TVO. Nice to be Always here. Always a pleasure to have you here. Let's, because this is a complicated story, let's do a little background first. This is all about who gets to operate wireless in Canada. Three big players so far, Bell, TELUS, and Rogers. Last October, the broadcast regulator, the CRTC, decides that Globalive, potentially a fourth big player in this, they operate wind, I guess most people have heard of that, they did not satisfy the Canadian control requirements, and so they weren't allowed to play. You took a second look at it, as is your right. You said, I have a different interpretation of all of this. We're reversing the CRTC decision. Globalive, you can play. Sure. How come? Well, it was primarily uh, a decision based on the legal facts on the ground. The, the test uh, before us is, uh, is the day-to-day -day management and decision-making in the company run by Canadians, by and large. And you were satisfied that it and was? And we were satisfied that, that it was based on two uh, grounds. First, uh, the majority of the board of directors are Canadian. And secondly, uh, 66 and two-thirds percent of the voting shares uh, related to the company uh, were, in fact, uh, owned and controlled by Canadians. But so the those, money isn't. The money behind no. it is not. Right. And that's, that's fine. I mean, uh, a foreigner uh, can have influence under our law. They just can't have control. And in this case, uh, we were satisfied that the Canadians uh, on the board and uh, with respect to the voting rights, which are, you know, not having voting rights, it's kind of like kissing your sister. It really doesn't count for anything because <laughs> you've got to have the voting rights with the shares, and these were controlled by two-thirds Canadians. But the CRTC obviously looked at all the same facts that you did and came to a different conclusion. Right. Have you had it out with them to understand why they went this way and you went that way? Oh, yeah. No, I, I spoke to uh, the, the commissioner, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's one of these cases, Steve, where reasonable people can differ. We're, we're not saying that uh, it, it was a bizarre decision of the CRTC or it was untoward. They had an interpretation of the facts on the ground. We had a different interpretation of the facts on the ground and how to apply the law in this case. And uh, uh, certainly it's within the purview and prerogative of cabinet to, uh, to overturn in those, in those situations. And the fact that the money behind it is Egyptian, does that concern you at all? No, uh, no, absolutely not. You know, it's a tight credit market right now. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, they, uh, they, in fact, were willing and able to put the money in. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, as long as they don't control the day-to-day -day management and affairs of the company, uh, that's the test that we employ under, the, uh, under this act. Do you think you've made uh, a new precedent-setting decision here? Absolutely not. We feel that we've applied the law on the facts of this particular case. This is a globalized case. It has no uh, bearing on any other, uh, any other uh, telecom uh, companies or any other parts of uh, broadcasting, for instance, uh, uh, or any other sector. This is a globalized only decision. Well, you, you won't be surprised to, say, to hear me say not everybody's sharing that interpretation sure. of it, that, of course, you mentioned broadcast. The people who run global television uh, would like to think, perhaps, that maybe uh, they can get some foreign money behind them as they go forward. They should not take that conclusion? Well, again, in the terms of the uh, Radio and Telecommunication Act, which is the act that I'm subservient to, it's an act of parliament, uh, the case was whether it was management and control. And in fact, in the case of the board of directors, it wasn't, the test wasn't do Canadians control the board of directors. The test was do non-residents control. So as long as non-residents don't control the board of directors, tie goes to the fact that uh, Canadians can control the, uh, the decisions of the Board of Directors. So it's, it's all these finicky legal mm -hmm. details, but the fact of the matter is they met the test. We had reviewed them uh, over a year ago. They met the test then, and we were satisfied they met the test now. Here's one of the bigger issues, which um, Michael Geist, you know Michael Geist, the I University do. of Ottawa. He writes about this stuff all the time. Uh, here's something he wrote uh, last year in uh, the Star. This is hardly the first time the foreign control issue has been raised in Canada. There have been earlier recommendations to scrap the requirements, most recently in the 2006 Telecom Policy Review Committee report, which concluded that Canada has, quote, one of the most restrictive and inflexible set of rules limiting foreign investment in the telecommunications sector among all OECD countries. I wonder if part of your decision, part of the decision, is designed to deal with those so-called restrictive and inflexible rules. No, it was a decision on the facts, but let me, can I just broaden it out a little bit rather than we can argue endlessly on the legal facts of the case uh, with Globalize. The reason this, this whole case came up in the first place, the context uh, behind it, not the reason for the decision, but the context why it was before the CRTC and before uh, the Cabinet of Canada, was the fact that we had made a decision uh, a couple of years ago now to allow new entrants 
into uh, the telecom space. There's all these smartphones out now, uh, and we had, as you said, three in, what we call three incumbents, Bell, mm -hmm. Telus, Rogers. So there was a, another part of the spectrum that became open for uh, smartphones and other high data uh, you know, devices. And you auctioned off the rights. And we auctioned off the rights, but we told the incumbents they weren't allowed to auction. The only way to have a, a playing field where the newcomers could actually come in and pay was to forbid the incumbents from, in fact, buying the auction. So and Global Life came in, they spent almost $450 million, yeah, I think. They, they did, and there are, there are, there's, there's Quebec Ore, there's, uh, there's Dave, there's Public, there's all these other companies that came in without, without having to deal with the, you know, the 900-pound gorilla in the room, which was all the incumbents and all of their market share and their, their financial power. They could bid amongst themselves and start to re-enter, uh, start to enter the market for the first time. And the so that's the context. Up, the opening up is important to you because why? The opening up is important to me because greater competition means uh, better uh, choices for consumers, uh, perhaps lower prices for, for consumers, and perhaps a higher quality of service for consumers. So this is, uh, we're, in, we're into the, uh, what we feel is uh, the stage where this will be tested in the marketplace very soon. We know that wind is going out there uh, full guns a-blazing, and, uh, and uh, Dave and uh, Public and others will be coming out very soon as well. And this should have a downward pressure on prices, increase the competition. The incumbents are going to have to battle for market share, which is a good thing. That, that's good for consumers. If you believe that, why not just open it all up, guns a-blazing, damn the torpedoes, and say foreign ownership? Come on in, you guys can compete too. Yeah, I mean, that was, and that was a, a, re a recommendation of a couple of reports. You mentioned one. There was another one uh, called the Red Wilson Panel Report mm -hmm. uh, that looked at com Canadian competitiveness. What do we have to do to be more innovative, more competitive? And they looked at that issue. That, uh, at this point, that has not been the government's position. Uh, I, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm a slave to that position. It's a position we, we enunciated uh, in the election campaign in 2008. We were not going to open it up. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we can apply the law. And the law in this case does allow... Okay, but uh, if you want to be intellectually consistent, do you have to say, we want to open it up because it gets you lower prices, because it gets you better service, it gets you better products, so let's have foreigners come in here as well? Well, I guess what I would argue is we did open it up. Uh, More. We are getting, uh, we are getting new entrants. Uh, they are Canadian-controlled entrants, and uh, they will be offering lower prices and uh, better quality of service and all of the things that we want in a competitive marketplace. I know politicians love it when their decisions are universally embraced, but you will not be shocked to hear this one has not been. Public Mobile is suing you, I think, are yes, they not? Yes, they are. Yeah. The company claims you broke the foreign ownership laws when you allow Global Live to operate, and you put other companies like them at a competitive disadvantage because they say they, play, they played by the existing rules and that this new entrant didn't. You want to respond to that? Well, suffice it to say we'll be defending our position vigorously in the court of law, and uh, uh, they're entitled to their opinion, but uh, I disagree with it. I think that we actually apply the rules and the law uh, equally. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of different creative financing took place for this auction. It was a lot of money at a time when there wasn't a lot of credit available from traditional sources, so you had to be smart. You had to be, look outside the box a little bit, and uh, that's what, uh, what Wind Mobile was doing. And, uh, so I, I'm, I'm quite confident that we're on the right side of the law, but they're entitled to their opinion, and one of us is going to be right and one of us is going to be wrong. Rogers, TELUS, and Bell control, I think, about 95% of the market right now yeah. in advance of Global Lives really getting in there. How do you think the entry of all of these other players will affect their business? Well, I think that they're going to have to get smarter and get better. And, and in fact, one of the executives of one of those companies, I won't say which one, uh, told me in no certain, certain terms that, yeah, with this increased competition, they're already changing the way they're doing business in order to meet the onslaught of the new, co new competitors. That's a good thing. It means they're going to have to be smarter, they're going to have to offer better services, a, a wider range, more choice, uh, different, uh, maybe no, no contracts, just as, uh, as Globalive is offering, these kinds of things, which are common in the marketplaces around the world, are very uncommon in Canada. And i got to tell you, Steve, uh, I know you've, you've mentioned a couple of critics. Uh, I had a number of emails from Canadians around the country, all of, many of whom, let's put it that way, have stories about uh, poor service or uh, uh, how they would like to have more choice. So I, I think that uh, people are chomping at the bit. Here's some numbers that I'm sure you're aware of. These are from StatsCan from last August. These are the wire wireless telecommunications carriers and their profit margins. 
And these profit margins have done okay. Starting back in 2002, 12.4%. The next year, 17.7%. The next year, over 20%. The next year, nudging up to 23.5%. And by 2006, the last year for which we've got numbers, they're almost touching 30% in profits. Um, that may have been affected, of course, during the recession. We expect those numbers will, will go down. But uh, given these numbers, do you think there's lots of give in the system, so to speak, for another player to come in? Yeah, I think so. And look, these companies are, are, uh, are able uh, and should make a profit. And when they make a profit, they can reinvest in their infrastructure. Uh, you know, we all want... We all want more bandwidth. We all want more broadband. Uh, we all want the smartphone that will uh, that will download a song or download a movie in zero seconds flat. Uh, that's uh, that's our expectation as consumers now. So they're they're busy rushing around trying to invest so that uh, we don't get frustrated with their products. So I get that. At the same time, uh, we just feel that if we had a new spectrum available uh, to go to the same players, uh, would give you the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, and we felt that this was a, a good time to get some new entrants into, into Canada, and uh, may the best uh, carrier win. But your decision will no doubt affect their bottom line, won't it? They're going to make less money. Uh, well, uh, it, maybe not. Maybe if they, if they have the brains and uh, the willpower and uh, the new business uh, plan, uh, they could come out of this uh, very good as if they're offering something that consumers want. I, I don't think it's my place uh, to predict who's going to make a profit out of this. It's my place to say, when you have new entrants, it means greater competition, it means more choice, it means on average lower prices. Let me follow up on those emails that you received. Cell phone uh, customers have often complained about these restrictive long-term contracts. They've said how difficult it is to switch providers. Are you doing anything at the moment? Are you doing anything at the moment to deal with those complaints? Well, I mean, uh, I, I guess I would say our, our big thing in the shop window is this policy that, uh, that we've just been talking about. The, uh, the fact of the matter is it's a, it's a matter of contractual law between, uh, between the, uh, the provider and the consumer. But you could pass regulations if you thought these were onerous. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, the best way to deal with these kinds of things is to give people a choice. And, uh, you know, I don't think you want bureaucrat X14 or politician Y17 to start dictating uh, what, what our vision of a, a perfectly competitive marketplace should be. Let's let the consumer decide, and I think that should be our focus. Okay, but other countries have put caps on long-term contracts. They put caps on what some consider to be extremely high roaming charges, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Not considering that? Uh, not at this time, no. Because? No. I mean, this well, is... Well, I, 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 again, we have our policy. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, when it came to high credit card rates, you guys were in there all over yeah, it, like... Yeah. Um, Stink on a goose, as they say. Well, you know, it's good politics too. I've I heard a lot about you. roaming charges, and yeah. uh, there's uh, lots of anecdotes, uh, including uh, one member of the national news media who was uh, doing a. I heard the story about him uh, uh, just sending uh, photos back and forth uh, when the prime minister was in China, and he was part of the Chinese. Uh, trip as part of the media and uh, got this bill for seven thousand dollars or something like that so <laughs> who was it uh, I, I won't mention any <laughs> names but I'm sure you can read a blog or two uh, but but okay. the, the, these things have happened there's no question about it I, I think the best uh, antidote to that is again more competition more access to more co more uh, consumer products let me ask you about something that some people scratch their heads about as well your government I'm told spent a million four over three years on developing an online calculator sure that would compare the cell phone plans and apparently a similar online calculator in Britain saved people 42% per month yeah. on their bills. And I'm told you killed the proposal just before it was ready to go. Yeah, How I come? Did. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, the problem with an online calculator is the product changes so fast. I can't speak to the British example. I can only speak to the Canadian example. Every season, whether it's the Christmas season or going to the new year, uh, the, the uh, telcos are offering new services. Uh, new price points, uh, different ways of packaging uh, their product. To, it would be impossible for the calculator to keep up with how the market changes. It's a very dynamic market. It changes all the time. I just came to the conclusion that th this was not money well spent. It wouldn't give the consumer uh, any other additional information that was accurate. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, why continue a program that was... Uh, costing some money and wasn't going to give the desired result. I'm going to tell you, because the conspiracy theorists and others, I guess I shouldn't mar try to marginalize them that way, some people say you canceled it as a kind of a, okay, you big three telcos, I kind of screwed you on this other decision, so here's my, here's no. my little fig leaf to you. No, in fact, uh, this, uh, this decision uh, uh, on the calculator was made several months ago. 
uh, well before the Global Live issue came up. So did it, they lobby hard against it, though, the big three? Oh, well, I, not hard, no. I mean, I did hear some representations, but uh, that wasn't, uh, to me, the deciding factor. I mean, we're talking about a $1.4 million expenditure here. Mm -hmm. uh, it is taxpayer money. It is important that we have value for money. Uh, I make decisions, you know, every week or every month uh, that, uh, that affects one carrier or, or doesn't affect another or what have you. I, I think ultimately I've got to make the, what I think is the right decision. And uh, I'm a very consumer-oriented industry minister, if I do say so. I mean, there's, one, there's different ways that you can see your role or define your role. And I am the industry minister. I'm not denying that. But I'm also, I see myself as the consumer minister. A lot of what I decide, particularly on the regulatory side, has an impact on consumers. And I don't, I, I don't regret that or I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that that's part of my role. And so when you hear industry minister, also think, here's somebody who also believes in the consumer and the power of consumers to change the marketplace. Just a follow up on that popped into my head because I'm always curious how decisions are made. On that decision to allow Global Live to be the fourth big player in this, is that your decision? Did you get to decide it, in other words? Well, you mean uh, in terms of whether we overturn the yeah. CRT? That was, that was a decision that I brought to Cabinet, and Cabinet made the decision. Okay. So you bring it to Cabinet, Cabinet endorses your decision, essentially. Or rejects it, yeah. Or rejects it, yeah. and you got the green light. Okay, I'm yeah. always curious whether you alone are allowed to do that or whether you got to no, get blind. No, and, and let, me, let me state for the record, before I made that decision, we consulted with everyone who, uh, who filed a brief on this before the CRTC, including the incumbents. I returned to them and said, do you have any other additional information you'd like to share with me? I also went to every single province and territory and said to them, is there anything you wish to say to me about this uh, decision before I make it? So it, was, it wasn't just me sitting in a room somewhere, just waking up one day and deciding to do this. I, I did a, a, quite a broad round of consultation on it. Okay. In our last minute here, uh, give us your kind of vision. I know that word gets overused a lot, but give us your vision on the future of Canadian wireless. How do you see it playing out going forward? What do you want to see happen? Well, I, you know, I have uh, this digital, uh, digital strategy, and, and I want Canadians to feel comfortable uh, to do uh, more e-commerce. I, I want businesses to feel uh, more comfortable and to have the incentive to do more e-commerce. I want more of society's decisions, whether it's, uh, whether it's Facebook or so other social media, to uh, have that, that power. So it's going to take some legislation, including beefing up the Privacy Act. Uh, the anti-spam legislation has got to be passed and also copyright legislation has to be passed. So there's three sort of pillars, three uh, legs of a stool that have to be done legislatively and that will help us have, a, I, I want, my goal is to have the most, uh, you know, digital economy uh, in the world. I, I believe that that is a goal that Canada should aspire to. How close are we to that right now? We're fair to middling. Uh, we used to be better several years ago, several generations ago in, in uh, these, this kind of technology. We were better. We were up uh, around the top three. Now we're at eighth or twelfth, somewhere in there. So we have to do better. Everybody says we got RIM, and then they're stuck for, you know, after that, it's a short list, isn't it? Well, yeah, there's open text, and there's all these other wonderful companies that are actually selling to the world. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, it's the framework that we, ha that we do things here in Canada. Part of it is making sure smartphones are available and competitive. Part of it is making sure that, for instance, uh, you feel, again, feel comfortable online, that the privacy legislation is, is amongst the best in the world, so people know that when they're online, it's not going to be some sort of uh, uh, feast uh, on their private information. If you wanted us to be number one in the world, was it a good idea to let Nortel be sold off to people from other countries? Well, you know, you look at uh, who, uh, who bought parts of Nortel, Ericsson, for instance, mm -hmm. they're spending, they are now going to be spending $200 million a year in extra R&D in Canada, hiring Canadians. They hired about 98% of Nortel staff that were in that particular area. So uh, I don't think it's, it's an either-or situation. That was a very troubled company for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But Nortel is not the example of our high-tech sector. It's, it's, it's open text, it's RIM, it's all the work that an entrepreneur like Terry Matthews does in Ottawa where he, he creates 20, 25 companies anew every year as startups in the, in the information communications tech, technology space. So that's, that's what I, when, I, when I see information communications technology, that's what I see. Okay. Industry Minister, Tony Clement, always good of you to visit us at TVO. Thanks. Thank you.